Now, Robert Sternberg, though, he thinks that there's three types of intelligences, practical, creative, and analytical. So analytical intelligence is like your academic problem solving and com computation. So that's most relates to like your book smarts, your ability to retrieve facts, understand complex relationships within uh, an academic setting such as mathematics. Now your practical intelligence, again, like your street smarts and common sense. How are you with people, seeing relationships, understanding human behavior, things like that. And then he adds into it creative intelligence. We have people who, again, they don't fall victim as much to functional fixedness. They in, are innovative, they're imaginative, and they problem solve from such a creative standpoint that nobody has introduced before. Okay, We need creative, creative people. Now, Howard Gardner pr proposed that we each have at least eight intelligences in the sense of we have a varying level of them. Some are higher than the other, okay? Now, he thinks the first one is what's known as linguistic uh, intelligence, so your ability to use language, uh, your articulation when it comes to writing, speech, things of that nature. Secondly, logical slash mathematical. Some people are mathematically inclined and they see complex relationships within the academic setting and are able to be able to navigate them with relative ease or whenever they persist with being able to understand mathematical equations um, and items within math, they can navigate it uh, eventually. They are able to solve problems. Now, some people are musically inclined. They are able to sing, able to play music. They have a natural rhythm within them that they can uh, keep on a beat and so create it with other people to be able to create a band or music in general. So beautiful whenever individuals are talented, um, whenever it comes to with music. Bodily kinesthetic and um, just going back to the musical, I think it's if there's one like intelligence or... Um, ability that I could have, and let me know if you agree with this, is just like with music, because when you play music, and especially if you can sing, you can just capture a room, and like everybody stops what they're doing, and they will listen to you, and I just think that's such a powerful ability, and I just, I wish that I, if there's one talent I could have, is sing. And, uh, yeah, it would just be really cool to be able to see, like, what an audience looks like whenever you are you have such an incredible ability like that and they just zone in to exactly what you're doing in that moment. You just command a room and you get to share your talents. You know, it's, it's, cool. it's funny because <laughs> I think I, I – experience the exact opposite in a classroom whenever I talk about and I'm getting into psychology. And although it's interesting to me, uh, basically all of this stuff, I know it's not going to be for everyone and that's okay. And I'll look out into the crowd or the, not the crowd, but the classroom and I'll have people just totally not interested in looking off into the distance or looking out the window on their phone, on their laptop. And it's just like, uh, it's a it's a different world, but then you also have those who are locked in, and so I guess I get a little bit of a taste of what that's like, um, but not not exactly to that level. Now, some athletes are bodily and kinesthetic uh, intelligent, so they have the ability to basically do physics, you know, as they are performing their sport, which is so cool. Um, they have very good depth perception and the ability to um, perform with their body and engage in athletics very adequately. So it's really impressive to athletes are very impressive when they're good at their sport. Spatial intelligence. So again, that relates to bodily kinesthetic in the sense of depth, understanding uh, spaces and things like that. Uh, your body in relation to uh, other items and where they're at. Okay. Related to bodily kinesthetic. Interpersonal and intrapersonal. Now, individuals who are good with interpersonal skills or interpersonal intelligence, they understand the relationship between people. So how to navigate and uh, understand what other people want and how to be uh, good with other people, emotionally and otherwise. All right. Intrapersonal is being intelligent regarding yourself. Okay, so this is having more so a uh, awareness 
as objective as you can be and honest with yourself as you can be, um, being reflective within yourself and trying to understand who you are and what you like and what you don't like. A lot of people are not as introspective as you may think. And whenever we combine these interpersonal and intrapersonal skills, these intelligences, we call this overall emotional intelligence. The, again, the ability to understand the emotion of yourself as well as others, show empathy, understand social relationships and cues, and regulate your own emotions and respond in culturally appropriate ways. All right. We also have those who are naturalistically intelligent. So those naturalists, they enjoy nature. Um, they enjoy the individuals and organisms within nature. And it's a beautiful sight to see and, uh, and, and engage in whenever you see those who are in tune with their naturalist intelligence. These are super caring, super kind, and very supportive individuals when it comes to nature. Okay. Next is creativity. I've talked about this a little bit briefly throughout uh, this lecture, but it's the ability to generate, create, or discover new ideas, solutions, and possibilities. And some attributes that are related to creative people include having intense knowledge about something. They work on it for years. They no look at novel solutions, and they seek out the advice and help of other experts. On top of this, something that you may not know about creative people is that they, uh, at least a good portion of them, tend to take risks. All right? And so <clears throat> what's often associated with creative, creative people is that they are divergent thinkers. They like to think outside of the box, and uh, you use when more than one possibility exists on a situation. So like... For example, with this, whenever they are given a, a problem, they like to think of either new ideas or new solutions that haven't been tried out before, or they have the ability to see new and better ways to navigate particular situations. Now, convergent thinking, this is the ability to provide a correct or well-established answer or solution to a problem. So we've got our divergent thinkers and our convergent thinkers. All right, so we've all heard of IQ tests before or measures of intelligence. So IQ stands for an individual's intelligent quotient. And um, this is like one of the first forms of standardization when it comes to tests. And uh, Alf Alfred Beignet was the individual who developed an intelligence test to use on children to, de to determine which ones might have difficulty in school. All right, and then Louis Terman, a Stanford psychologist, modified Beignet's work by standardizing the administration of the test and testing thousands of children to establish a norm. And so what we've seen, the average IQ for uh, individuals is 100, but the average falls within a bell curve. And so between 85 to 115 is going to be the average IQ score. The overall average is what I say. But um, moving forward with some other measures of intelligence, we have the David Weschler's definition of inte uh, of intelligence, which means the global capacity of a person to act purposefully, to think rationally, and to deal effectively with his environment. And so he developed a new IQ test by combining several subsets from other intelligence tests. Okay, And the main thing that I want you to take away from this slide is what's known as the Flynn Effect. And so after years of use within schools and communities, periodic recalibration of WAIS, Weschler's you know, test, led to an observation known as the Flynn Effect. This is the idea that each generation has a significantly higher IQ score than the last. So don't tell your parents that you're smarter than them, but whenever you um, look at the data, it suggests that uh, we're continuing to get smarter with each generation that passes, okay? Known as the Flynn Effect. As I've mentioned um, recently, in um, whenever it comes to the bell curve, so we have to have, when we're doing these testings in general, a representative sample. So a representative sample is a subset of the population that accurately represents the general population. So when you're gathering individuals, you have to make sure that, of course, it's random, but you have to have a significantly large um, 
number of people to be able to prove statistical significance. And so whenever it comes to this, uh, for the bare minimum to prove st statistical significance, most experiments will require 30 participants. But if you want it to be very accurate, you're going to need a, a significant amount, a large amount of people. Okay. Now, when it comes to the bell curve, which I already, I already described, 82% of um, the population have an IQ score between uh, 85 and 115. Okay, and so whenever you have uh, you're navigating the bell curve is what I should say. You you'll have what are known as standard deviations. And so whenever you have one standard deviation below or above, that's going to include about 82 percent of the population. And so as mentioned, between 85 and 115 is considered average. Now the most commonly scored is going to be a hundred. That's again the average overall IQ. But if you want to be within the average of one standard deviation below and above, that's going to be eight between eighty-five and one fifteen. Now, if you are two standard deviations above or below, that's going to be below average and above average. So for individuals who have an IQ score between one fifteen and one thirty, they are considered above average. Now between um, 70 uh, approximately and then 85 or 84 I should say is you're going to have that's going to be your individuals who are uh, below average now here at 70 and below that's going to be well below average and then at th between th at 130 and above that's going to be well above average so that's a brief introduction into the uh, bell curve especially whenever it comes to uh, your IQ